I think a lot of people think that they could, uh, if they've done sales before, that they could, they could sell Medicare supplements. And the reality is when, when you remove the ability for somebody to actually see your face and see the gestures you make and, and help to convey the whatever empathy or sympathy you're feeling, um, that becomes a lot more difficult for trying to, to transact the sale. So that's why I think a lot of people struggle. Plus, it doesn't, the game hasn't changed in that you still got to go through a lot of no's to get yeses. And I think a lot of people struggle with that still. They think that, oh, with automation, with all the new tools we have at our disposals, with the perfect sales script, we can uh, eliminate that and we should only have to go through two no's to get a yes. And it's just not true. You are listening to the 8% Nation podcast, created to help you become a top producer in the insurance industry. Enjoy the show. Welcome to this week's 8% Nation podcast. We have a very, very special guest, Eric Fierro, friends of, of, I mean, close friends. We are all friends. The Medicare Jefe. (laughs) Dude, he's Hispanic. Well, you know, we, I'm going to give you a quick intro, that? Eric. That? For those of you that, that don't know, you've spoken at Apercent two times or once? Panel, keynote. So Apercent speaker, yeah. um, you know, really big time Medicare telesales, powerhouse, tens of millions in premium in the last 24 months. Um, you are the guru, the man of telesales. Uh, we are honored and excited to have you here with us. Um, Cody, do you have anything else to say about this this gentleman? Dude, he's, a, he's a he's a you know what he is? What is okay? He? He's Careful. a he's a secret monster. Okay. You know what I mean? Like there's people in our industry that I think need to be more well known. He's one of them. Yeah. You know? I also think there's people in our industry that are even more talented than they know. He's one of them because yeah. he's, you know, dude, super humble, man. You know, well, like if I was just as talented as you, I'd be beating my chest like every day, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, man. Nice. It's Shut true. up. Cody, you are, you're freaking more talented than me. Uh, Medi- on, Medicare tell sales is hard, 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 dude. dude there's no doubt. Like so it is hard. not easy, dude. Like I, I work with a lot of call centers in Medicare specifically. Yeah. And I mean, it's tough to get those cost practices where they need to be to yeah, make yeah. sure they keep the wheels turning. So you know, you guys over uh, have four call centers, Medicare call centers, you know, uh, 10, you know, 50 people between all the different organizations, um, tens of millions in premium. I mean, you're, you're running the one in, you know, in, well, Phoenix, technically yeah, Phoenix. Phoenix. I don't know if it's actually Phoenix, but well, it's Chandler, it's Chandler, but it's 20 minutes from Phoenix, but nobody yeah. knows Chandler. Home of the first ever retreat. That we had. Hey, was yeah, that the first one? Was I a part of that first Chandler, one? Chandler, you're right. You know, a special story real quick before we get into yeah. this. So Eric and Eric Fierro and Justin Brock hold two very special places in my heart because my first my first ever event with Cody Askins as a business partner was the retreat that we did in Phoenix. And I was super intimidated about the insurance industry because I'm like, certainly not everyone's like Cody where it's like just chill and casual. That everybody's probably suits and buttoned up. Yeah. And, uh, and then in come, you know, Eric Fierro and Justin Brock and it's like chill dudes easygoing guys, but monsters. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So you don't have to be all suited up and like, think you're this, you know, something special. You can actually be a chill dude. That dude, is a human being. Eric walked around bathing suit, no shirt the whole, whole weekend. <laughs> all day. We're not talking about Eric the John here. That's right. <laughs> he said, we're not talking about Eric the John here. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Eric. Love you, Eric. That's man. good. He's you gonna enjoy. He's gonna watch this too. That's so awesome. <laughs> well, let's let's get into the the content with our with our friends. So you know, Cody, I figured you guys have a long relationship. How'd you guys meet? Like, what's your what's your background? I, it was actually it was it was because of the very first eight um, percent. I started seeing Cody uh, posting a lot of content online, and and I would follow it and I would watch it. And then uh, when he announced the first eight percent. I just said I wanted to be a part of it, and uh, and so I think that he had done. You you had either done an interview or you had talked to Justin because of the at the time it was the Medicare Coach Facebook page. Yeah. And so he's the one who introduced me to you, and then we got onto a couple of conversations. Got I think we hit it off right away, and then um, from there we just kept finding reasons to keep chatting, keep talking, and then, Dude, then we got on the text together, and we just started joking together, and then we would just yeah, it just it, it went crazy from there. Yeah, now our, our families have hung out, you know. I mean, yeah. I say family for you. I, it's just me and Lauren, but you know. <laughs> but it's it's been it's been yeah it's been great, and you know it was one of the uh, 
it, it's, it was for me one of the proudest moments uh, at last year's 8% Nation to be on that stage. And, and that was one of the first things I did is I kind of just laid out for everybody how often I had seen you just in the past couple of years and to see the culmination of where we're at right there with all those agents sitting in front of us. Here I am on stage at an event that my good buddy had, uh, you know, put on and, and it was just, it was such a cool experience, man. I loved it. I had so much fun on that stage. I think that's one of the coolest things about everything that we're all doing, you know, um, is I become challenged and motivated when I get around big time people and have some fun. I agree, totally. Every time we hang out, um, I leave saying, dang, I got to do more. I agree. You know? Uh, and, and so I, don't, I think a lot of people are like that, too. That's the power of like retreats and events at 8% and, you know, free live training events, everything else we do, everything you do, uh, is most people, they stay in their own little bubble, man. And if you do that, I think you're going to stay in your own little bubble forever. And you think you're all that because your little bubble is like, you know, yeah. you're probably the impressive, most impressive dude. But then you get around other guys and you're like, oh, wow, these guys are awesome. Like, how do I get on their level? So. Yeah. Did, did that, that happen to you in the past? You know, because oh. you, 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 will, you will agree you should be farther ahead than you are right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of um... – there's been, you know, there's, I think there's always a lot of setbacks as well that maybe you don't expect them, but they happen. And so you have to roll with the punches and, uh, you know, it, it's just part of business It's part of growth is that you're going to try things. You're going to fail at things. And when you fail, you can either sit there and wallow or you say that sucks time to move past it. Let's try something else. You always need to continually be growing. Right. I think at the end of the day, uh, one thing I have seen a lot in the agent industry is that agents will grow to a certain point where they get comfortable with a nice paycheck. They got 500 clients and, and then they kind of stop growing. They just really focus more on just how referral business and servicing my existing clientele. But I think that even in this industry, even if with resi residual income, you always have to keep growing because Clients will pass away. Some clients will get taken by other agents. It doesn't, they don't just stay there, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that complacency is going to lead to, uh, you know, to, to a loss of income and clientele. If you just sit there, you always have to try to keep growing, keep pushing, keep trying new things. Well, and you're, you're the, you're the uh, epitome of that considering you started, you were in charge of, or I'm not sure what your exact role was, but two years ago is when your guys' you know, telesales organization uh, got off the ground. So why don't you, if you don't mind, like, why don't you walk us through sort of a little bit of your journey on, you know, starting that, what went through your mind, maybe some of your setbacks. It sounds like you maybe have had some setbacks. Maybe there's some people listening that have had similar setbacks. Maybe you can share some of those. Um, anything you can share, man, we'd love to hear, buddy. And before you start, that's, that's what's unique about you too, is you're like crazy transparent, you know? I mean, you'll talk about the bad stuff, yeah. you know? People are trying to get me to open up and actually talk about the bad stuff, yeah. you know, more. They're like, oh, it must just be a perfect world. You yeah. know, it Everything, never is. Yeah. Everything you touch turns to gold. Yeah. But I, I love that you do that. So thank you. Yeah. I think it's, it's very much, um, it, it's a, it's a product of social media that a lot of times we only see the good, right? Because that's what we mo mostly, who wants to show the bad? It's not something that's going to catch a lot of attention, but there's so many people who do need to hear that part. They need to hear that, man, there's struggles, there's struggles in this game. And, and it's not like, Hey, because I follow this exact system that somebody laid out, whether it be you guys or me or anyone else, um, you'll still come up against struggles. You know, there's a, uh, the reality is that it, in starting a new call center, it helps that we, that, that I got to partner with an amazing group with Heartland financial. Um, and, and it also helps that, that, I'm not, I'm not actually in it alone. Like I get to do this with a team of amazing guys who, um, who we get to collaborate on a weekly basis to really uh, hash out what's working, what's not, what can we do better? How can we get better results? How can we lower our CPA? How can we, uh, you know, how do we convert better? How do we get better sales training to our agents? Like everything that you could think of, we're constantly trying to work on, right? To try to, to try to get better results and grow. And at the same time, we all have that same vigor. Like we're excited about what we're doing. We're really passionate about the industry that we're in. And as a result, we get to translate that to anybody, any of our team members who are on the daily grind talking to our consumers and trying to get them to, 
to, to join our organization, right? So um, I think that having, a, having an awesome team and, and understanding that you can't do it all is one huge factor in anyone's ability to grow. And I feel that I've been really fortunate that I didn't pick the team that I ended up working with, but Heartland did a great job picking them. And I think as a result, I really lucked out that I really enjoy the, uh, the camaraderie we have, the time we get to spend together, uh, the, and the idea that we both, that we all have uh, very similar mindsets in how we want to grow, what direction we want to go, and how we go about doing it. You know, and, and the cool thing is, is there is sometimes there's some uh, there's some uh, clashing of ideas, but that's good. You need that. Right. If everybody was thinking the exact same thing, then I still think that you could. That's a hindrance to growth. You need friction. You need that friction so that you can think and see things from other perspectives and say, you know what, that actually makes sense. I probably wouldn't have thought of that or I maybe wouldn't have thought of that for another year or two. You know, but because you have another another team member who who has seen things that you may not have seen, that experience comes in handy. So that's what I love about teams. I love that because you can really uh, work off each other and use each other's experiences to to shorten that timeline of growth. You know, and I think that's why you guys provide so much great and valuable content because you're just trying to do the same thing for agents. You're trying to shorten that 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 learning curve, and so am I with the university. I'm trying to shorten the learning curve for a lot of people. So they don't have to necessarily go through all that and they can learn from our experience. Right on. Well, and another thing too, that I feel like you represent, we were talking about off air early. I really feel like another one of, at least my passions has become really raising up a new generation of insurance professionals that are using insurance as a vehicle to make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, because I just, I always think about this and I, I maybe say this too much, but nobody visited the insurance booth on career day. You know what I'm saying? But there's more millionaires on the in the insurance industry than any other industry in the world. And why is that? And I think it's because, you know, we just need to be more vocal. But this is a huge opportunity. I think ultimately it's not sexy. It, well, let's bring yeah. it back. Let's bring sexy back. That's here. what you're doing, man. You're you're, you're making <laughs> insurance sexy. There's a hat. There's a hat. Right? Make insurance sexy again. I don't know if it ever was, but I know yeah, I was going to say I can't but, do it. I don't know if it ever was either. But you know, but you know what? You know what's sexy? You know what's sexy? The, the the trips that you can win from these insurance carriers. If you guys have ever been on those? I mean, any producer listening, it, strive to hit the mark and go on one of these uh, excursions or on one of these uh, conventions that the insurance carriers put on. Because I will tell you what: when I first got in the business. It was about, man, I would love to do something that I enjoy and I can make money at. But when the first convention was offered by a carrier that I was representing, I was just like, that'd be amazing if I could go to Aruba, you know, that'd be really cool. And we qualified and I went and I got hooked. Like I literally, I, I, I've never had so much fun because look, I don't know about you guys, but I've traveled on my own dime and I've traveled on the insurance carrier's dime. It is so much more fun to travel on an insurance carrier's dime. I'll they tell you always, guys why. They always spend more money than we do too. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a lot of fun and it's a huge motivating factor for me. Whenever I see that a carrier is going to put out uh, a convention, it's like, well, I want to qualify, you know, for a little while I was actually um, able to go on at least uh, three to four trips a year uh, because we were just qualifying for so many things. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was just so much fun. It's awesome. I, I think it's great, and, and it and it it makes you not want to miss it. Like when I when I when we like we've been on a few together. When you go, you don't want to not go again. Like yeah. it's like it's like making a hundred grand and then going backwards. It's like who wants that? Nobody. You know? No. It's yeah. like having a hot yeah. wife and then having a not hot wife. It's like who you want who wants that either? Let <laughs> <laughs> it that yeah, out. We'll make sure Lord doesn't hear that. But she's hot. <laughs> But it's, it's the same thing, you know, that you were saying earlier, Cody, where going to these conventions, it's like when you go to the, in like an 8% nation, you're surrounded by elite producers doing some amazing things. So not only are you enjoying the view, the food and, and the ambiance, you're also getting to talk with some amazing people that you can learn from, make new relationships and, and, and have a lot of fun doing it. So it, it's the same reason why I want to go is that I want to learn. It helps me to learn more. 
You know what? You just gave me an idea for something. I don't know why I'm in such a random mood today. Uh, Frank is in any sleep, and I was here late, and I got up early at 5.30 and worked out. But uh, you just gave me an idea of something I think we should do. And, and I'm sorry if I'm not asking any good questions. Uh, I think that I'm going to throw, maybe you'll have to kick off the year or something, like a power networking retreat and invite some of the biggest players I know in the industry to come and hang out for a weekend and just be around each other. Like how yeah. sick would that be? Yeah. That's that's that would be a blast. You, you, you get the credit. You gave me the idea. So well hey let's let's uh let's just talk let's break down, you know, in uh, Medicare telesales, you know, why do you think it's so hard, first off? Um what you know, because it is a struggle, man. I don't know what why it's so difficult, but why do you think yeah. it's so difficult? Yeah, I think, well, man, there's there's a lot to it. Uh, I think a lot of people think that they could, uh, if they've done sales before, that they could they could sell Medicare supplements. And the reality is when, when you remove the ability for somebody to actually see your face and see the gestures you make and, and help to convey the whatever empathy or sympathy you're feeling, um, that becomes a lot more difficult for trying to, to transact a sale. So that's why I think a lot of people struggle. Plus, it doesn't, the game hasn't changed in that you still got to go through a lot of no's to get yeses. And I think a lot of people struggle with that still. They think that, oh, with automation, with all the new tools we have at our disposals, with the perfect sales script, we can uh, eliminate that and we should only have to go through two no's to get a yes. And it's just not true. It, I mean, it helps. Automation helps and all that stuff helps. But at the end of the day, you are, you have to realize that if you're in the industry that we're in, if you're in the senior industry, there's a lot of people who are trying to get in front of those people and have conversations in person and over the phone. So you have a lot of competition. You have to stand out. And one of the big things to stand out is that you have to make sure that you take advantage of every moment you have on the phone with them because they're going to only give you a few precious ones, right? The most, the most expensive things now are, are, are time and attention. That really what, that's what it comes down to. So we have to make sure that if we get them on the line, we say the right things to try to keep the conversation going, that we ask a lot of questions, which I go hark back to a great training that Cody did when he came down to Phoenix, where he hit the same marks. He was like, you got to ask these questions. You got to keep staying in charge of the conversation by asking questions. It's non-threatening, to be honest. And I think a lot of people think that in order to be successful in sales, you have to have that type A dominant personality and you don't, but you do have to be brave enough to keep asking questions and you do have to be smart enough to know how to respond when they, when they actually answer these questions so that you can follow up with another question. Um, that's why I love so much what you're doing when you're putting out those videos of you and your teams training in the morning, uh, doing those, those, you know, those, those question answer trainings, because that's, that's the kind of stuff that agents need to be training on daily so that they can get better that's part of being a good sales agent is you do have to train all the time and and you have to really sharpen your your ability to ask questions on the drop of a dime so that you can keep that conversation flowing so i think a lot of people quit because it's hard you know it, they, they, they're hoping that somebody out there has a magic pill or a magic bullet or magic something that would make it so that you only have to get two no's to get to a yes i haven't found it I don't think anyone's found it. And so, you know, I, I think that that's, that's really, again, it comes down to the social media perception where you, everyone is trying to sell something online. So that's part of what they're tagging is, you know, uh, hey, we got the perfect system and roll here and you're going to be uh, making six figures in no time. I, I just, I haven't found that to be a reality. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, so, you know, you guys have been on a rocket trajectory, you know, just crushing it in premiums and, you know, Help me understand what have you done? Is there anything you can share that would help? You know, some you know, cause how'd you guys start? First off, was it one one call center? And yeah, yeah. Line? So it originally started with a call center in uh, in Kansas City um, at a, out of the Heartland Home Office because they just they had the space and um, they decided they wanted to, to to get into that marketplace. So they started it off, and at the time that I was a, I was a marketing director at a at another organization for an FMO. Um, you know, we were kind of at a crossroads where the company was getting bought out and I could choose to either uh, continue on with the bought out company or I, I was actually thinking about just going off on my own and being an independent agent. You know, uh, 
I got a hold of my buddy Ted Gray and I told him what was my plan. And he said, dude, what if we partner and open up a call center? And I said, that takes a lot of money. And he said, again, what if we partner and open up a call center? And I said, are you serious? He's, he's, I said, absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's, uh, you know, to me, it was a, a perfect fit because obviously I, I felt like I had the skill set necessary to make it successful. And I just really love the idea of starting something and, and building up something from scratch again. So yeah, I had to start all over again. Uh, I think I was at my last organization 12 or 12 or 13 years. So I had to start all over again. But because I partnered with the right people, I think that really helped us to get onto this rocket trajectory. But it was no, it's no easy feat. Like I'm telling you guys, it's, 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 there's a lot of, there's been a lot of setbacks along the way. There's been a lot of things that we had to learn in terms of the quality of the people we're hiring, what type of personality we should hire, uh, you know, and, and that comes in all sorts of, you know, different ways. What's funny is uh, I, I hired some people that I thought were going to be stellar salespeople and they were, they ended up being some stellar salespeople. But the reason I felt like it was the wrong fit is because they wanted to be me. So instead of being happy within the organization, they wanted to instead open their own, you know, do their own. So, uh, so it was kind of like all I was doing was renting their time for a little bit and, uh, and then they moved on. So it's kind of that thing where you're trying to find that perfect balance. If it even exists where you have people who are, are excited about what you're doing, they're excited about your vision, excited about, uh, your, the environment you've created for them and they want to be loyal to that and they want to grow within it. That's, that's what I'm looking for. And, and it hasn't been easy to find. You know, we've also in some of our other agencies, we've found some uh, some of the hurdles that we have is that uh, the demographic isn't isn't uh, large enough for us to really find licensed agents. So we actually have to go and uh, train from complete scratch new people, hire them with no licenses, get them through the the exams it takes to get state licensed, and then from there have to train them in the business. Uh, I, again, I have an internal version of the university. So that platform has been pretty integral in, uh, in training up these agents as quickly as possible and really has helped the managers and the other call centers as well, uh, because they can basically sit down for two weeks, uh, live and breathe that university. And by the time they're done, they know quite a bit more than most agents out there selling Medicare today, to be honest. So it's been, uh, it's been, a, I think a, a really cool part about what we're doing, but Again, it hasn't been easy, and we've made we've made some mistakes and learned from them. Uh, but that's life, you know. What's the biggest mistake you've made, or that you or the company? I I think that maybe maybe the one of the mistakes that we've probably made is that uh, we we I guess I would phrase it as we took our our, our foot off the gas a little bit. Um, and I think that with with a call center, there needs to always be a constant flow of leads coming in right? There always needs to be a constant flow of leads. We got to a point where we thought we might have overproduced some leads. Uh, and so we wanted our guys to just start working them and we stopped bringing in new leads for a little while. And, and I think that that was that, that it was, it was, uh, something that I hope we don't do again, because I don't think that we ended up getting the results we had hoped for. So, uh, I, I think that one of the, that's, that's one of the things that I feel like I've learned is that we always need to have a flow of leads coming in whether it's the Christmas season or not, you know, because a lot of people think, Hey, it's, it, you know, you know, who posted about this earlier today was Michael McCormick. Um, what does he not post about? <laughs> exactly. But it was real timely, right? Because that's, that's exactly what it is. It's a lot of people think because AEP is over and because the Christmas season is here that you're not going to make any more sales. So they took their, they take their foot off the gas. They stop focusing on it. And that's kind of what I'm trying to allude to right now is that, that's what I feel like we did. We took our foot off the gas, but I think we need to keep it on the gas throughout the entire year in order for us to continually grow. And I think that was kind of one of the, the things that, I, that, that uh, we could have probably done better last year that we, we're going to hopefully do better this year. That's good, man. That's really good. So it sounds like you, uh, what I like to try and do is try and kind of separate out what I would say the ingredients of what's made you successful. It sounds like one of the things you've hammered on is an amazing team you know, around you. Another thing is don't take your foot off the gas. What are some other crucial ingredients to your success? Yeah, I think uh, there has to be a constant desire to get better. Uh, even, even for the top agents in our organization, there has to be a constant desire to want to do better, set a higher goal. So what we try to do is uh, on a micro level, we have a daily goal, we have a weekly goal, we have a monthly goal. 
And any time that an agent hits said goal, it's time to increase, right? And so, and I don't care if it gets to a point where they're like, that's not feasible. Who cares? Go for it, right? What do they say? If you shoot for the stars, at least you'll get to the moon. So keep setting, keep, you have to keep increasing your goals. And man, who better to say that to than the guys that I'm talking to right now? Jesus, you guys keep doing that same thing. You live that out, right? You keep increasing your goals. You meet one, you increase it higher and higher and higher. So uh, that's, that's, I think, a crucial ingredient as well to the growth of, of an organization is you have to keep setting those goals a little higher all the time. Right on. What, you, know, you seem to have a heavy hand in like training. How, what, what, walk me through um, how important do you guys put you know, an equity stake on training? Like how, how's, how important is that to you guys? Uh, it, it, is, it is probably one of the most important. I mean, when you put out your name into the, into the, into the world, and I think that when you are a, a call center, you essentially uh, – can end up having a target painted on your back, right? There's a lot of negative comments that are made out there by by uh, the broker world uh, regarding call centers, and you know, to, to some extent, maybe some of the claims they've made have been true. But we're trying. What I've always said is, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be an organization that has the call center reach, but the agency feel, right? So the local agent feel. So I still. I want to send out anytime we write, write up somebody on a policy, we want to send out the holiday cards. We want to send out birthday cards. We want to send out thank you cards. We want to keep in touch with them, but we get to also uh, integrate the, the aspect of where we're right now. An independent agent has to be the salesperson, the customer service person, the, you know, they have to wear all these different hats. We get to parse that out and actually have people who specialize in each of those things, which can be a very big benefit to a consumer. So, you know, I think that there's definitely enough room for both types to, to uh, operate in this world, right? In this Medicare space, especially, because I think we actually have a shortage of agents to take care of all the silver tsunami that's here. Uh, but, I, and I think, and I, I do, and I think we just need to kind of respect each other more. You know, I think call centers and brokers alike need to kind of respect each other more in that aspect that, hey, we're all trying to do the same job. You know, uh, we just... We, we, we might have a bigger reach, but we're, we're still trying to make sure that when we talk to somebody, we deliver accurate information, that we are very well trained in terms of our knowledge so that when we are uh, providing that info, if they go and tell the, the local agent, oh, well, this agent told me this or that, that we don't have egg on our face, you know, that we're not disseminating bad information. So training is huge, huge part of what we do. Huge. Mm. I mean, I'm guessing you do it every day? Yeah. Walk us through what you do with your team, because I think that's a valuable piece that you said also the, the, the you know, national call center reach, agency feel. There's a lot of agents out there that feel alone. They're not training every day. Most are failing, and I think that's the, the toughest time to fail when you're just all by yourself. What do, you, what do you do with your team that you think everybody should be doing? Yeah, so I think that it's important. Again, it's funny. I've been doing, as long as I've been doing this, there's still some things that I forget. I may have been an expert in it five years ago, but because I haven't used it in a while, I might've forgotten. So if you have a resource, like if you have an online training resource, it's good to go through it. Uh, you know, even if it's just one module a day, just to e refresh your memory and, and be aware of, of that. But it's also good, like I said, to sharpen your skills the way that you do with your team. So we've adopted some of the stuff that you guys do with your teams. We've adopted that here just to be faster at, you know, you guys call it something different. I call it ARPing because I, I read a book called the conversion code where they talk about answer, respond, pivot. And so um, that's, that's basically, it's the same exact thing that you do uh, just different words, but that's, that's a big thing that we like to practice is when we get an objection, answer the objection, uh, you know, so you just or acknowledge, I'm sorry, it's acknowledge, respond, pivot. Mm -hmm. So you acknowledge the objection, respond to the objection, then pivot with the question to keep the conversation going. Because again, that pivot puts you back in control. So we practice constantly trying to stay in control of the sales conversations because in, again, on the phone, it's so easy to just hang up on somebody, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, in person, at least they got to kick you out of the house, but it, on the phone, they can just hang up on you and end that conversation. So it's, it's for us relationship building and getting that place where we can become relatable to a client is, is what we're constantly working on so that we can build trust and make a sale. That's good. 
That's good. That's very similar to the three A's. That's awesome. That's really good. Yeah. Right that's on. right. The three A's. That's what you called it. What are the three A's? Agree, answer, ask. Uh -oh. Which is acknowledge, respond, and pivot. Got it. I didn't even know that existed, but it's literally the exact same thing. Or, yeah. That's good. Well, is there anything um, that you're seeing on the horizon trending? You know, like, like my perception, and maybe you can just correct me if I'm wrong, but my perception is is that a lot of Medicare sales is actually moving. It's moving towards telesales. Would you consider that a true statement? I think a lot of people are getting a lot more comfortable with the idea of making transactions over the phone. It's definitely uh, more convenient. You know, and, and again, I'm not talking trash on any anybody who still goes to the kitchen table by no means. I think that that's there's a lot of uh, it's still a really big uh, growth sector to be able to go into the home and make sales and build a book of business that way. And obviously, it's it, it can be to an extent easier because you get to be face to face and you get to to read the, the physical cues that somebody has. But Again, it kind of goes back to scaling. Depending on your goals and how quickly you want to scale, it's a lot easier if you sell over the phone to scale and start selling in three or four different states versus just where being limited by where you can drive to, right? There's a lot of people who are getting into this business that live in very rural areas and they don't have a very big footprint that they can try to go reach. So they really have no choice but to either drive a lot or they can look to get into telesales and master that craft so that they can they can uh, scale faster than, than they would if they just went house to house. Right on. How much of uh, your lead development is digital? It's all digital. 100%. Yeah, it's all digital. So it's either, it's either through Google traffic, it's uh, Facebook, YouTube. Um, I don't, I don't think we do any, any, any mailers for, well, I take that back. We, I think we did do a mailer for AEP for Medicare Advantage because that seems, they seem to pull a little bit better uh, for the Medicare Advantage space, not the med subspace so much anymore. But uh, that's that's probably the only time we do a mailer drop is is going to be during AEP for uh, Medicare Advantage. Outside of that, 100% digital. And, and is the focus on those to drive an inbound call instead of a response vehicle? Uh, actually, no. We get a lot of response cards. Although we do get some inbound calls, um, we do get uh, we. It's a lot of response cards that we have to try to call and reach, and got a lot of bad numbers and all that stuff that you got to deal with with direct mail. Well, any, any lead, any big telesales centers that I did, they have a percentage of their leads that they just almost throw away from bad lead or bad numbers and all that. But um, isn't that weird that like they went to the effort to respond to the direct mail piece or whatever, and they gave the wrong number. Just I never understood it. I never understood it. I mean, I remember there's, I think some of it is they get upset about all the mail they get. <laughs> so they're just like, oh, well, I'm going to cost them money. They rip it off and just send it back. Or they think you're going to mail them something back instead of call them. You know, yeah. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. At the end of the day, like I said, I'm constantly trying to think about new ways to to get in front of the consumer because obviously it is difficult. I think it's getting more difficult because of the amount of phone calls people are getting. Uh, but there's got to be, there's always going to be a way, right? And it might be through mediums that we don't even know are going to be popular with seniors yet. You know, I don't know. What if all that talk that Gary Vee says about TikTok and all of a sudden you have the senior population starting to start to go to the TikTok, and that could be a, another new medium to, to advertise on. Uh, what if it's actually going to be more based on text communication? You know, it could be that the future is based on text communication. And so I've been uh, kind of uh, planning on doing some things in that arena as well, where uh, I, I, instead of, you know, uh, just sending him a text, I want to text over a, a link to a, a personalized video that we make. So for each lead can get some kind of video from, from each of our agents, you know, depending on who the lead is, gen is, is uh, sent to. I don't know. I'm always thinking about a bunch of different ways, but I'm trying to stay ahead of it because at the end of the day, that's, that's just what we got to do as marketers, right? Nothing's going to be tried and true forever. Things will constantly change. That is the only constant. Well, the silver tsunami, as you say, which is hilarious, and I'm going to start saying that now, is uh, the, the trends on Google are, are representing that as well. So the, the people that didn't used to get on Google and look for answers on plan F, G, L, M, N, O, P. Um, they didn't used to go to Google. They used to pick up the phone or talk to a relationship. Well, now they are actually savvy enough to go do the research online. And the keyword traffic is, is massive. Yeah. Um, on that note, do you guys do some SEO or some, or some organic YouTube videos and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, we do. So we have, we have a, 
we have a couple of sites that we use for, for more of the organic uh, Google traffic and also for Google AdWords. Um, and so we, we're trying to capture as much, of, as much as we can from the digital markets. And obviously based on our budget, we determine where we're gonna hedge more of our bets so that we can, again, at the end of the day, feed the uh, amount of agents that we have to feed every day. So that's yeah. kind of the balance for us, right? We have so many agents, they have to have so many leads a day. So we gotta, yeah. we, we gotta figure out what's gonna get us the best results. Are you comfortable sharing the number of leads per day or per week or per month per person? Is that, is that, is that a... Well, right now, I think we're kind of probably on the lower end of that. Uh, I've, I've asked around to a lot of call centers to kind of be like, hey, what are you, what are you providing your agents per day? Um, and so for us, it's normally gonna be somewhere in the range of, I don't know, depending on the time of year, maybe eight to 10 leads a day is what we'll try to feed them. Which that's going to add up, you know, I think it's, I mean, that's pretty similar to our guys out here. You know, it's not, they're not selling Medicare, but they're still yeah. talking to people and trying to close them. So. Yeah. It, it helps you build your pipeline for sure. Yeah. And those would be your eight to 10 A leads, right? Newly generated new leads. And then they have a database of pipeline and they also have H B leads. And most likely, is that how you guys do it? Yeah. Yeah. So after, after so many attempts of trying to reach the A lead, then it becomes a B lead. And then we actually have a different team that focuses on calling those B leads. And if they can get them on the phone, they'll transfer them back to a live agent. Okay. I see a lot of people doing transfers just in some capacity. It's yeah. just a, it's a good way to try to make something out of that still. Right. Because again, at the end of the day, we spent money on all those leads. So we're just trying to see if we could still turn it into something uh, because there are, there's a lot of people who just, fill out the information so that they can read or see or get a quote or whatever, but they're not actually ready until three months later. Yeah. I've got a lot, a lot of people reach out to me right now about age leads and how they want to call them and then live transfer them to a closer and all that kind of stuff. It's happened yeah. more than they used to. So I wonder if it's like a shift that's happening because I'm noticing an age lead sort of boost as well. I wonder if it's a shift that's happening because so many people are doing digital that now there's like this massive amount of, well, you, you've seen the cost go up too, you know, oh, yeah. on, on, oh, the, yeah. on the new side. So it's like, then yeah. you got to start to, you know, either adopt some of that or tweak what you're doing, which we always do. And obviously you do too. Some um, amount, most call centers use some amount of just volume type lead, whether it's age lead or low buyer intent, you know, digital lead, whatever that ends up being, just to kind of fill the gaps and have enough people to call. I see that happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, if you, yeah, if you fed your reps, just brand new leads, daily it wouldn't keep them busy you know right right eventually they have to end up working older stuff because it's it's just the nature of the game otherwise they wouldn't be busy um but we actually do this we, we did this cool thing with our software that uh, we call it the pull program so whenever an agent runs out of leads to call for the day uh, they can go to the pool program hit a button and it'll give them 10 leads they, they can get up to 10 leads every five minutes or something like that so they get 10 leads, they call them, they hopefully get a conversation and they'll surpass that 10 minute window. And then once they're out of leads, they can hit it again and get 10 more leads. But it's just a cool way where it took a little bit of stress off of us to make sure they keep, they keep getting fed. And instead now they just got to click a button and it'll feed more leads into their system. So again, that's not something that I did. Uh, it's something that again, having a great team behind us who can, who got to execute that, that cool. that's really important to have a good team. That's really smart. That's really cool. Do you have any uh, scripting tips you can give us? You know, the duration average, what's your average duration of your sale? Like what's your general script breakdown? I know you can't get specifics, nor should yeah, you. I think, I think Do you target talk sale. time? So average sale time, it, it's normally going to be uh, a little, just a little north of an hour. Uh, and it depends if it's a Medicare Advantage call, you're probably looking at north of an hour and a half. Um, because as a, as a call center, when we do advantage calls, there's a lot more, we have to literally read a script word for word and can't deviate from it. So, uh, it makes it a lot more difficult, uh, but Medicare supplement calls can normally be just a little North of an hour. Some of them are going to be a little shorter. There's going to be always those people who are just like, I'm ready to go right now. And so that call could just take 30 minutes. But in the majority of the time, when you have to do a little bit more selling, that's when those calls are going to probably be just north of an hour. If you're doing a good job, building relationship, getting that rapport, and then taking the application. So it's, and, and it, again, we do it all 100% over the phone, like without any screen sharing. Uh, in again, since we opened, we haven't screen shared once, even though I have it in my training uh, on the university to show just in case you ever need it for any reason. Uh, I, I, I can't think of the last time I actually did a screen share. 
When you say screen share, are you talking about taking over their monitor and helping fill out? What, what do you mean? What do you mean it's, by that? Well, so back back when telesales was start, first getting kicked off, uh, I think there was a lot of seniors who mistrust. They had a lot of mistrust, obviously, because they they weren't used to doing business this way. So what I would do is I would say, uh, Mrs. Jones, what I can do at, during this application process is I can show you the portal. I can show you my computer screen so that as I'm asking you for your name, your address, your date of birth, you can see that I'm plugging it right into the Aetna's electronic application. And, uh, and then you can also see that when it comes time for signature, how we, how we do the signature and all that stuff. So I would just share my computer screen as long as they could get to access to the internet on a computer. I'd share my computer screen and they would just walk along with me and see me doing the app to give them more peace of mind that I'm not just hoarding the information and I have some nefarious use for it. Got it. Mm. Cool. Right on. Yeah. Really cool. Mm. You said you had some funny questions for this guy. They're not funny, but just fun. Ooh, I can always go with a fun one for Eric. Uh, Hmm. What was, uh, before you went up to, uh, on, on stage <coughs> at 8%, it's not funny, but were you nervous? Oh, of course. Yeah, I, I get nervous anytime I'm about to speak. It doesn't really matter about the size. I, I in fact, just to just let you guys know, it's funny. And even if when I'm going to go talk in front of my own team, uh, if I'm going to give like some type of motivational speech or something, I get nervous. And it's not until I just start speaking out there that it's almost like I'm an actor, I guess, where all of yeah. a sudden it's like game time. And then I just turn it on. And then from there, I just go, but yeah, I, I am always nervous when I'm about to speak in front of a crowd. That's good, man. Good. Um, what's your what's your what's your favorite kind of food? Uh, Barbecue? Chinese, Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Why, is that why is that why we went to PF Chang's our first first? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. But that's probably not your favorite Chinese place, though. It's one of them, actually. It's one of my favorite Chinese okay. places. But there's obviously a lot more. There's a few hole in the wall places as well that probably still put MSG in their food that are real tasty. Um, but yeah, I love, I love Asian foods. I even like, I like pho. Uh, I love having a good soup and, uh, I like Thai food. I like, I like a lot of the Asian flavors a lot. Uh, you do too. I do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong, man. Yes. I know I'm Hispanic and I love Mexican food. I love Salvadorian food, but, um, but it's not my favorite. I don't know if that's a sin to say, but it's not my favorite. <laughs> what, uh, I have a question. What would you, what would you get? If you had like a young God, like 19 year old kid that's like, Eric, what should I do in insurance? You know, what, what should I do? What would you tell them? Uh, I, if they, if they have the right, the right mix of stuff, right. In terms of their desire, their drive and a commitment, I would say, you know, if they're, I guess let's, let's, let's juxtapose it to they, they're considering college versus getting into the insurance business. I would say absolutely save your money, get into the insurance business. That's what I would say. I would say, I would say, I would, you know, let's get, get good training, get a good mentor uh, and, and let's get into the insurance business. I, I could have saved myself a fortune if I didn't, if I just went straight into the insurance and didn't go and get my degree. Well, and I was telling my son, I have a 10 year old son. I was, well, he's not 10 yet, almost. And uh, I said, I don't want you to get a business degree. I said, if you, I mean, you can do it if you want, I'm not going to stand your way, but Let's learn how to do business by doing business, right? Do not go to college to get a business degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not that I'm like, I love my college. I'm not saying anything against getting a degree if that's the direction you need to go. But I feel like the, 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 in my industry, the marketing industry, things change over so quickly. I was speaking to a professor the other day that was saying, we have no case studies, no peer-reviewed reports to talk about digital marketing at all. That's why they're inviting us to like speak at their uh, digital marketing classes wow. because there isn't like it changes so quickly. Like imagine a professor talking about digital marketing, Eric, like imagine like what, what would they be able to add value to you on? Like, no, you're the guy that runs millions of dollars of budget through a system. You need to be teaching them what's going on, you know? And so that's what I feel like is interesting about the business world is it changes so quickly that I think it's tough. I feel that I feel that the um, the educational system is gonna is gonna I mean, it's already qu quickly changing, but the more that uh, that that professionals who are who who don't necessarily have a professional designation to be able to teach, but have the real world experience, the more that those guys put together their own courses and put that info out there and sell it, and 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 people start consuming it and learning from it and putting it into practice, 
the more that catches on, the less n- the need there is for a traditional university. Because what are they going to have to offer at that point? I mean, I don't need to learn about, uh, you know, stuff that, that isn't going to really apply to me. People don't want to do that anymore. They want to learn something that's going to be tangible that they can use right away and can actually build a foundation on. And that's why I think these courses that we're making, the course creators make that are actually from people who are practicing in the business, that's going to keep taking off more and more. I see that industry getting bigger and bigger. Well, tell us about your university before we uh, wrap this thing up. Yeah, so my university uh, obviously has going to have a strong focus on selling Medicare, uh, Medicare supplements, Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, it's going to show, it's going to go real in depth on product knowledge so that you can be, like I said, more proficient than the majority of Medicare agents who are out there today. Uh, because so many Medicare agents got a very small crash course on how to sell Medicare and they really don't know all the ins and outs. There's a really cool trend happening right now that there's a lot of great groups out there. Uh, on Facebook and stuff where you can go and and get knowledge from other professionals who've been doing it for a long time and learn a lot of stuff and and shorten your learning curve. But what I like about courses is that it puts it, it puts it in order for you. It puts it in order and it teaches you what you should know before you get out there and start selling. So the university focuses on product training and then it focuses on sales training. Then it focuses on marketing with the intent that you first need to know what you're selling. Then you need to know how to sell it. And once you know how to sell it, now you need to learn how to market it so that you can get in front of people to, to utilize the selling of the product. So uh, it also has a bunch of great tools that are, that are included in the university that uh, I, I think anybody who's going to be serious about selling should have at their disposal. Um, and it's, uh, like I said, I think it's one of the best courses that are, that's out there because it's, it's truly something that I, I'm, I started with the foundation and then I started tweaking it like crazy once I had masses of people going in there and saying, Hey, um, can I, they, they would ask these questions and I'm like, Oh, that wasn't addressed in the university. Let me make a quick video. And I'd make a quick video and address it. And I kept doing that over and over until the question stopped, you know, because at that point I'm just like, okay, I've covered pretty much every base needed that people. And, and again, while all the while still putting it in order so that you learn it when you should be learning it. Yeah. Well, what, what, what's the name and, and web address for those that want to check it out? Uh, Medicare Sales University. So you just go to MedicareSalesUniversity.net. It's a .net. .net. Yeah. Got it. Cool. I think I might have even forwarded the the Medicare Boss. If you go to themedicareboss.com, I think it might have forwarded to uh, MedicareBoss.com. I didn't even I didn't even know yeah. that. But you have to do the MedicareBoss.com. The MedicareBoss.com. Well, thanks for joining us, Eric. Is there anything you want to leave? You know, we have a generally uh, younger audience I, in general. Uh, is there anything you want to leave with the uh, up and comers in this industry or just, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, if, if you guys are listening and you're contemplating getting into the insurance industry, this is the place to be. Uh, I think for the next 15 years, this is going to be a huge growth sector and the potential for you to make a lot of money while actually helping people and feeling good about what you do, the potential is huge. So I would say that if you're on the fence, jump in, just make sure that you find some great training along the way. Make sure you have some good mentors who can help you. Uh, and, uh, and I think that us as resources, we're great resources to help you guys get hooked up in the right places. Uh, for those who are already in the industry, if you're in final expense, you know, I would say, uh, it, it's, it's good to, to diversify, right? It's not, it's not always good to be a one trick pony. So, um, even in the Medicare arena, that's why we don't just sell Medicare. We cross sell several products so that we're not, uh, necessarily a one trick pony. Now the majority of our business will be in one arena, but again, it's because we love that residual income. Uh, but outside of that, we still want to make sure to diversify and, and have several different product offerings it makes you a better agent anyway. So uh, yeah, best of luck to everybody. Again, these two guys, they're amazing at the content they're putting out and I'm really thankful for them in this industry. Uh, and so I just say, keep following them, keep, keep learning from them. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. You too, bro. Well, thank, you. Thanks for that shout out, man. It was great to see you. Uh, we'll see you on the next one, man. Yeah, for sure, guys. Thanks a lot. Right. Appreciate you, bro. Hey, if you love this podcast, which you did, and thank you so much for watching the Nation podcast. I got a couple quick videos for you to watch 2020 Medicare updates with Mr. Tony Merwin and how to start an insurance call center. Click on one of those podcasts, check them out, and I'll see you there.